Hi guys, this is Melissa with The Face of Malpractice. And today I wanted to share my benzo story and how I ended up on benzos and what my journey looked like after and where I am today. Um, what led me to benzos is a journey that started back in 2018. Um, I was a Muay Thai boxer, an amateur boxer, um, and my trainer wanted to demonstrate um, wanted to do a demonstration of a technique on me to show to show the class and my partner um, how to do a, a move correctly. And unfortunately, uh, he let his ego get in the way. And um, instead of doing a demonstration, uh, he showed he he took he took the hit and the blow um, at full force. Um, he is a six foot three male, probably over two hundred sixty pounds, muscle. Um, was a former boxer to say the least. So I'm five foot two. I was a hundred pounds wet. No matter how strong I was, unfortunately, I could not have restrained his weight from that blow. So I was left with a concussion, a traumatic brain injury. And those symptoms, what those symptoms look like is I was dizzy. I was lightheaded. I had balance issues. Um, I had some short-term memory loss, specifically with meetings. Like that was the one thing that I was like, losing memory of is meetings on my calendar. So that was that was something I noticed a few months later, actually. Um, and then I would notice sometimes under stress that my nerve, like now I know it's my nervous system shutting down. Um, at that time, I was not aware of what was happening. So I would just stop talking. I would, when I felt overwhelmed, I kind of felt like I shut down a little bit. And so at that time, the concussion was the worst thing I had ever experienced. Um, I had never suffered a concussion before that. Um, I had never experienced really any health symptoms before that. I was super healthy. I had no mental health issues. I've never experienced depression, panic attacks, PTSD. I hardly knew what anxiety was. I've experienced anxiety twice in my life. Once um, when I moved back to the States, I was living in Spain at the time I moved back to America and my manager, uh, I had this new manager that was just hor horrible. He was horror to say the least. But um, And then the second time was after my wedding, um, which was a couple months right before the TBI actually. Um, so I had gotten married a couple months later, less than a couple months later, I had the TBI. So two times in my life I've experienced anxiety. So um, I was a super happy person. We all have our own stuff to say the least, but uh, I had a really beautiful life before that moment in time. So TBI happened, symptoms started to get better by four months. So I was doing much better. I had some symptoms remaining. Um, I didn't understand a lot of that. I didn't understand the TBIs. I didn't understand, my doctor didn't educate me on what to expect, what symptoms can come. And, and so I think that caused, um, the path that I went on. So at month four, I actually had a relapse. And at that time I started a new job. And I think the stress of the new job um, caused this relapse. Um, I relapsed vestibularly. So it was like just distortion. So it was like the relapse happened. All I could see was distortion, which was extremely scary at the time to say the least. And, um, and I stopped sleeping so that I had this relapse. And what happened was I went into a sympathetic response, went into fight or flight. And when you're in fight or flight, like any wild animal, you're up and alert, right? That that's the purpose of that response. And unfortunately I had no idea. I didn't understand any aspects of the central nervous system. I didn't ex understand the fight or flight response. Um, it was nothing that I've ever experienced before. And my doctor didn't educate me on what to expect, or even after this happened, instead of educating me on how the um, the polyvagal theory or how the nervous system works, instead, my doctor had decided to prescribe me an SSRI, Lexapro, and an SNRI, Trazodone. And it's really difficult looking back to see like, why was I put on two serotonin inducing drugs? And I realize now that the Lexapro that I, you would take during the day was prescribed to me because when I went to her office, I sat in the room and I was crying. I was like, I haven't slept. I'm having a relapse. I don't know what's going on. 
And I realized now that she couldn't handle my crying. And she took it as, oh my God, we need to give her a drug to calm down for the day. And it's like, I'm sitting in your office crying because I don't know what's happening to me. Educate me. Anyway, long story short, I was prescribed both these drugs, which were only effective for like the first few days in terms of insomnia. Cause my only goal at that point was I need to sleep so I can heal my brain. And so um, my goal was to figure out how to sleep. So the, the trazodone helped for the first few days, but after that it, it was no longer really effective, but now I'm on these two drugs and I'm told you have to stay on it. Yeah. Take six weeks for this stuff to work. You can't jump off of it. You need to stay on it. Okay. So as a couple of weeks are passing, unfortunately I start to experience, um, severe anxiety. And when I say anxiety, I mean, like, imagine having Eminem in your brain wrapping 112, 120 miles an hour. And like, this is just happening in my mind nonstop. And I'm like, what, what is going on here? What is happening? So I had severe anxiety. All of a sudden I started getting chemical depression at that time. I didn't know that was chemical depression. It almost felt like someone pushed the button and boom, I would get depression and then it would go away as fast. Obviously, those are <laughs> very obvious signs for chemical depression. And I think it's really hard to diagnose chemical depression for so many other people. In my case, I had never experienced depression before. So it, that was how it presented itself. Um, I also started to experience, I had POTS, which um, was the the regulation of my heart sitting leg from laying to standing, bunch of heart issues. And ultimately I ended up with serotonin poisoning, serotonin syndrome, which is what's mentioned on the drug insert. And um, that felt like I was just being poisoned to death. Like I remember waking up one day and feeling like I am being poisoned to death. I, I could hear the ants crawling on the floor. I was so sensitive to sound. I felt like I, I wasn't going to live. It just, I, I knew I was being poisoned to death and I definitely thought it was the drugs to say the least. Um, I also started fainting a lot. I went up in the ER. And so when I saw my doctor, I said, Hey, I think this is what's happening. Like there's something going on. And, um, their response was, have you ever fainted before? I was like, once a decade ago when I was putting in my nose piercing when I was living in Europe. Oh, pre-existing condition, he wrote. Um, at this point, now I'm seeing, a, I have a second doctor involved in this process, okay? So the first person that prescribed it was a neurologist that told me to go find another doctor after my relapse, um, <laughs> which was really great. So she prescribed me, told me to go find another doctor, um, and I found this other doctor, which is now supposed to be one of the greatest specialists in TBIs, one of the greatest rehabs, rehabilitations in New York. I'm thinking I'm in the best hands. And um, at this point, he had saw me a few times. And when I came in, I'm like, there's something wrong with these drugs. Like these drugs are killing me. I, there's something going wrong. And again, when I told him I fainted in the shower that morning, he told me <laughs> it's a pre-existing condition. So um, there was really nothing else to say there. He wasn't listening to me. Um, after that appointment, the nurse actually tested my vitals. They didn't do it in the beginning of the appointment like they typically would. And when they tested my vitals, they're like, there's your heart is failing. Your heart is, it was like 39, 40 at that point. Um, and so they're like, we can't let you go. And they called the doctor and he's like, what's going on? I'm like, I told you there's something wrong. I'm, I feel like I'm dying. I feel like my brain is being poisoned my body. And he said, oh my God, I think you have. Well, first he said, oh my God, <laughs> do you did you eat breakfast? <laughs> like that's going to happen from not eating breakfast. I mean, it was just the gas lighting and it was just unimaginable that someone could think like this when I'm telling you the list of symptoms I'm experiencing, um, including psychosis at that point too. And um, so I said, I never eat breakfast and that's not what's happening. That's when he said, oh my God, I think you have serotonin poisoning. He goes, the next time this happens, go to the hospital. Um, and so just to be really clear, like if you're experiencing serotonin poisoning or any effects to the drugs, going to the hospital, they're not going to do anything. They're not going to get you off the drug. They're not going to educate you 
on how to come off. That's your doctor's job. And so <laughs> my doctor did not read the room. Um, he denied all the other symptoms, which are obviously now um, mentioned on the drug insert, every single one of them that I was going through during the SSRI and SNRI. So, so um, at that point, you know, things are only getting worse. Serotonin poisoning. I'm ha I'm fainting all the time. I'm ending up in the emergency. I have POTS. I have psychosis. I developed OCD. I literally, if I touched the window, I would not sleep. Like just because I touched the window. I mean, this isn't, it was insane. And I am someone, again, I have never experienced hardly anxiety in my entire life and left alone these crazy symptoms. Um, and the combination of these symptoms. Um, and so things are getting worse. And six months in, I'm like, I can't do this. I think it's the drugs. They kept gaslighting me, letting me know none of these effects are the drugs. The hospitals that I kept ending up said, no, it's, it's, it's they're like, this drugs don't cause these issues. So they denied the serotonin poisoning and syndrome. They denied all of the symptoms. So they kept telling me it's you, Melissa, you know, you should, you should, you know, you need to see another doctor to get more drugs. They, it was insane. It was just craziness when I look back now. So at some point I decided on my own that I will, I'm going to come off these drugs. Cause I really do believe that is that, um, I, these drugs made my insomnia way worse. And so, um, I had decided that I was going to go do cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia first. So I went through that entire protocol while experiencing all of these symptoms and um, it ended up helping me quite a lot. I would highly suggest CBTI for anyone that has um, really bad um, insomnia or anyone that just wants to help improve sleep hygiene and rewire the brain. I mean, that's the purpose of the protocol. If you're familiar with it, you may know that uh, the VA had their veterans do this protocol when they returned back from war. It is proven to be the most effective form of insomnia treatment out there over any psych drug. Um, so it was quite helpful to say the least. Um, and then after that protocol is when I decided let's come off of these drugs. So I started tapering off I had told my doctor I decided this. He didn't, I could tell he didn't want me to come off for whatever reason, um, but he still agreed to it. And I asked him, how do I come off of these drugs now? And he had told me, you could cut 25% each week. So I tried that and I started to get all these added symptoms on top of it. I was like, no, something is not right. Um, and after just, you know, after that feedback, I was like, okay, I'm going to come off at 10% um, 10, 10 to 15%, I think I did. I, I don't recall the exact percentage, um, every few weeks. And so, um, that's what I did. I started coming off. I had, I, all those symptoms that were happening started to get less and less, but further on, cause I had to come off Lexapro and then I had to come off Trazodone. So I did have those those group of symptoms for quite a while through it. And there was points I had worse anxiety, worse psychosis. Um, it was just insanity. And they, the fact that they convinced me was me and I believe them. And it was like the man in the white coat is telling you, we just hand reverence, whatever you say, we believe. And that is just, it's so crazy. Now I look at it and it's, they are so uneducated in the drugs they prescribe. And so I finally got myself off of these drugs. I think the total, it took me six months to get off of both Lexapro and Trazodone. Um, and right before I was getting off of the last pill, Trazodone, I was thinking, oh my God, I'm doing better. Am I great? No, I have, I still have a lot of symptoms, but I was doing so much better. So I had so much hope that it was the drugs. And I had no idea about protracted injury syndromes. I had no idea what that is. So I thought the day that I was going to take that last pill was the day was going to be my last symptoms and everything was going to go. So the last pill came, I took it. I like, it was the best I had felt in a while was I well know, especially when you're kind of fighting for your life through this journey and you have doctors denying what you're going through, you're in such a fight or flight response and 
like the amount of trauma that we experience dealing with the medical system that's telling us it's not you, you need to stay on the drugs, not helping you, and you're experiencing all these symptoms and you have no idea what's happening to you. My gut was telling me it was the drugs, but my mind believed the doctors. And this was the dichotomy I struggled with throughout that journey. So I get off the drug and I was like, I'm free. This is going to be great. And then all of a sudden I started having symptoms of PTSD and that was the most devastating. So I started dealing with PTSD. I started having more psychosis started coming back up, um, anxiety, severe depression. And this is right now happening as we're entering COVID. So I'm being locked down in my apartment in New York. It was a disaster. So, um, after that, I was like, oh my God, maybe it was me the entire time. I, my understanding, was, I, when you stop the drug, you'll have no more symptoms. That is what I thought was going to happen. And I'll be honest, I did not do extensive lit like reading of literature, research. I think I had such fear of doing that because I didn't want to find out if it was me. Like, it was almost like I was scared to do research to be diagnosed as dead. Like Google was going to tell me I'm going to die. And so, and when I mentioned that to the doctor, I have such fear to do research. He's like, oh, don't, don't do research. Google will tell you you're going to die. Don't do that. So, well, there you go. I mean, I handed my reverence to this doctor, um, which clearly didn't leave me in great places. So anyway, so I started having PTSD at this point all of these crazy things. And I found a new therapist in New York. And when I was telling him that I'm going through all these symptoms, he told me, Melissa, if I was you, and he said this from day one, like every single session, he had said this to me, Melissa, if I was you, I would take a Xanax. Melissa, if I was you, I would take a Xanax. Oh, Melissa, I have clients that take up to two milligrams of Xanax. If I was you, Melissa, this is what I would do. He kept repeating that every session. And I started to believe, what is this Xanax? I, yeah, I've heard about it in movies. I don't, I knew nothing about psych drugs. No one in my family was ever on psych drugs. So my family had no experience with any psych drugs. I grew up in a homopathic fam, um, family. My, my mother raised us on all organic food. I mean, even my toilet paper was bamboo paper. I mean, just to draw a picture of um, how natural path my home was. So, and my, I think my dad was on um, maybe blood pressure bed and that is it. So we knew nothing about these drugs. And so when the, this therapist is telling me, Melissa, you should take a Xanax. If I was you, I would take a Xanax. Well, long story short, I went back to my doctor for our check-ins and I told him that this doctor, this therapist is telling me I should have Xanax because of my PTSD. Um, blah, blah, blah. And the doctor went on to prescribe it. Um, and when I was received this prescription, I was obviously not informed of dependence. I was not informed of, of the risks. I was not informed that one in six would be left with a synthetic brain injury bind, benzodiazepine induced neurological dysfunction. I was not informed of any of the side effects. Um, nothing. Zippo, none yet. There was no informed consent. Um, and so Fast forward, I actually didn't take the Xanax. I There was just something in me that was like, maybe you really shouldn't touch this. And so I avoid touching it for quite a while. I think nine months went by and I never touched it. And I was having episode after episode. Now I know that was protracted injury, um, protracted syndrome or injury after the SSRI and SNRI. Um, I didn't know that at the time. I was just in full panic. And when you're having all these symptoms and you don't know why you're having, having it, it is making your symptoms worse. Your episodes are getting worse. You're in constant fight or flight. And so nine months later, um, I think I was under such severe stress of my symptoms and not knowing what was happening that I had, I had then one day developed vestibular neuritis, of course. Like I, it's so crazy to see how healthy I was in the best shape of my entire life before this moment in time. And now I'm here fighting for my life. And because of all the stress in my system, I now develop vestibular neuritis. And 
when I woke up with vestibular neuritis, I was like, I can't survive this. Like I'm already fighting for my life. And now I have vestibular neuritis, which is, I would, I got out of bed. I would be like sinking into the floor. My perception of the room, I couldn't walk through doors. It was a disaster. And I had no idea what was happening. And I had contacted my doctor and I said, I think I'm going to take the Xanax today. This will be the first day. So I wanted him fully aware of what I was taking. And he knew, and he was like, yep, take it. And that was really the beginning of my benzo journey. Um, I, <laughs> um, I took 0.25 milligrams, the lowest dose of Xanax uh, for two months. And um, at that point I had in between all of this, I actually moved to Florida. So while I was communicating with my doctor in New York, I had to find another doctor in Florida to help with this vestibular neuritis and help with all of this. And um, she had told me, oh, you don't need to worry about your doctor prescribing the Xanax in New York. I will prescribe it for you here in Florida, which was fine. Either of them could have prescribed, but um, figured it was easier. They both were aware of my history and all of that. So um, she's now prescribing me Xanax at this point under the provision of my other doctor, which was a, um, a neurologist. Um, and so I'm on it for two months and I'm like, I'm trying to... I'm dealing with vestibular neuritis, which was horrific on top of all my other symptoms. I still have PTSD symptoms. I still have psychosis. I still have severe chemical depression. I have severe anxiety. I have severe panic attacks. It was just crazy. And I had no idea that this was coming from due to the SSRI and SNRI and the protracted injury. And so fast forward those two months, I had decided, I'm like, I need to come off of these drugs. Like there's... I don't know. I just felt like it was time to come off. Something just didn't seem right about them. And I had asked my doctor, um, the one in Florida, how do I come off of these drugs? She's like, you just come off. I was like, I don't have to taper. She's like, well, you have enough pills. I had like 18 days of pills. She's like, you have enough to come off in two weeks. She's like, good luck. Like, no, <laughs> literally, I think she said that we're good luck. Um, she literally didn't did not tell me at all what to expect. She told me, I could, she told me just to cold turkey at that point. And I was like, well, don't I need to taper? She's like, well, you have enough if you wanted to do that. Um, and so she suggest, so she was insinuating that two weeks was plenty enough. She was suggesting to cold turkey. Um, and um, so I was like, okay, well, here's a doctor telling me this. Maybe I can just come off. I didn't know that about this drug. And so I started coming off. I knew that she wasn't going to prescribe me anymore. So I had to figure out how to come off in those two weeks. And I thought I was going to die. Like I was living in the bathroom, vomiting nonstop. All my symptoms were getting worse. I'm, I thought I was going to die. Like I thought I was going to die, die from just throwing up. I could not stop throwing up. And I'm trying to manage a job through all of this, which I don't know how I did that. But so now I'm... I'm going through these two weeks. I am dying. And I get to the end of these two weeks and the symptoms calm down. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to get through this. I'm going to survive. Well, all of a sudden, all these new symptoms started appear. I started getting super itchy. I started getting, um, oh my God, my thighs were so itchy. Every time I would walk outside, which was like a winterish at that time, the cold. I mean, I felt like I was like, my skin was being burnt. And so I'm like, this is not right. I had such severe anxiety. I like would wake up in the morning and I could not get out of bed at all. I felt like I was just so sick. And I'm like, oh my God, is this my PTSD? Like, this is how little information I knew about these drugs. I literally thought, I'm like, is this my PTSD? Is this my PTSD manifesting? Maybe I didn't need those drugs. Did I need those drugs? Is this me getting worse? And so at that point, the new, the, the Florida doctor, the lady, I'm like, okay, you're like, you're, you're not really helpful. Let me speak back to my New York doctor, which is completely in the loop of this whole process. And I'm explaining to him, oh my God, this is what's going on. I'm having all these symptoms. Melissa, I think it's your PTSD. And I think you should go back onto the benzo. So that was probably the worst decision I've ever made in my life. Um, this, so this was after, this was a little more, right? This is a little more than two, two weeks after. So it's probably two and a half weeks and I'm going through all of this. And I'm like, I, 
I listened to the doctor and I'm like, okay, I got to go back on. I can't handle these symptoms. I don't know what's going on. And so I go back on and that was when I kindled. Um, kindled is a, a known phenomenon associated with benzos, barbiturates, and ethanol. Um, when someone either lowers their dose or comes off and then goes back on or increases their dose. Um, by doing that increases your odds of neurotoxicity and um, brain damage essentially. So at that point I went back on and I was on for four more months. And um, after I went on, things only got significantly worse. I was having, now I know a paradoxical reaction to the drug. I had already going off the drug that fast, I already had caused a level of neurotoxicity. Um, and so going back on just amplified all of this. Um, I had a paradoxical reaction. I had interdose withdrawal, um, which was horrible. It was just, I was like manic at this point. I was waking up screaming on the floor, crying, yelling. I remember the first, I at this point was when I actually shoved my husband. It was the first time I've ever touched my husband. Like, and I think that was so devastating for me. It's like, I'm so out of control. I shoved my husband. And of course he was fine. It was just a small shove in comparison. But the fact that I touched him and I did that, it was so mortifying for me. And I was just losing full control of my body. Um, and I, Obviously I'm telling my doctors, this is what happened. I'm now, I'm speaking, I'm working with both of them. So it's like, I have this doctor in Florida, the doctor in New York. And because the doctor in New York told me to go back on, I'm reaching back out to him. Like there's something happening to me. Oh my God. And um, I had mentioned to him, I got an email from Mount Sinai that was talking about ketamine for PTSD treatment. And I'm like, oh my God, maybe this is my answer. And so when I spoke to the doctor, he was like, absolutely. Yes. He goes, this is what you, this is what you should do. You should do ketamine. Um, and so I found a ketamine center. So I am on the benzo. I'm going through paradoxical reaction. I'm going through interdose withdrawal. I'm experiencing all of these symptoms and I go to ketamine. I go, go, I go to the ketamine center and I start treatment. So just to give you some information about ketamine. So ketamine works on the glutamate receptors in the brain. So if that's ketamine here, works on the glutamate. Well, when you look at benzos, benzos work on the GABA receptors, okay? So you have the, the GABA amino acids, which bind to the GABA receptors to help expand the receptor to allow chloride through. That is the function of benzos. Um, well, that's the function of the GABA. And then benzos bind to the other side doing the exact same thing but force it to stay open force the the GABA A receptors to stay open and to allow chloride through and so that is how that's the mechanism behind benzos however you really can't affect the the GABA receptors without affecting the the glutamate and all the other receptors dopamine serotonin all of that so um I definitely would never suggest to anyone that is taking a benzo to do ketamine. Now what I know, um, because my brain receptors were already so severely damaged um, and adding ketamine only forced more damage. So um, the other thing to mention about ketamine is that ketamine is metabolized by the cytochrome P450 enzyme in the liver. And so is benzodiazepines. And um, unfortunately, when you add drugs that are being metabolized by the same enzyme in the liver, it can cause over sedation. And unfortunately, that is what happened to me. Um, ketamine was probably the worst experience at that time of my life. I thought I was dying during the, the sessions. I would be tripping balls like and I, all I could think about was wrapping that IV around my neck. I wanted to die right there. Like if there was a window in that room, who knows what it could have happened. My husband was in that room with me, just keeping me down, trying to not prevent me from going, going bonkers and jumping out a window. Like that was his role in all of that. And so ketamine made things significantly worse. And if you look at Dr. Jordan Peterson's story, he was also told to do the same. He was told to actually get off of his benzo and then do ketamine. And it went horribly wrong with for him as well. 
again, obvious. I mean, it's when you start to understand how the brain works and that nothing in the brain works in isolation, then you would understand um, how the combination was just lethal. Um, and honestly, taking multiple psych drugs, it's just so fucked up to even do that to a patient. Anyway, so ketamine is not working well. And I then one day after ketamine session, end up with over sedation. And over sedation, now this is like now officially the worst thing I've ever dealt with. Like it's only progressively getting worse. Like it is beating out everything I've experienced and just triumphing all of it. So I'm over sedated and over sedated feels like, imagine drinking like four bottles of NyQuil um, and not sleeping. Like you don't have the ability to sleep, but you swallowed four bottles of NyQuil. Like you feel like you're being poisoned to death by that NyQuil and you're so sedated. It, it, it was the craziest thing. And every time I would take a benzo, it would increase the over sedation. So like after like two days, I could not handle it anymore. And so um, I spoke to my doctor and I, I'm like, I need to like, I, it, I don't know how long this over sedation is going to happen, but I like, I need to start cutting the benzo because it's increasing the over sedation. And I can't, it's, I feel like I'm going to die. Like I will die if this doesn't, something doesn't change. So we agreed I was going to come off 25% of my benzo at that point. Um, and it is, and it is worth mentioning. I was on the 0.25 the entire time until the last two months, which I was doing ketamine. And while I was doing ketamine, um, I needed to start increasing the benzo because it was like, I was like, I, it's not doing anything. And so my doctor was like, okay, start increasing the dose again, interdose withdrawal, paradoxical reaction. I have ketamine. This was a, a disaster. So I'm increasing this dose. Um, I went up to 0.8, so less than one milligram. Um, that was 0.25 to 0.8 in two months because of what ketamine was doing. And I'm thinking, there's something wrong with me. It's me. The ketamine center told me 70% of people this works for. And I'm thinking, why can't that be me? Why is none of this working? Why am I dying? And why do I need more drugs? What is happening? So... So now I have 0.8 milligrams that I need to come off of that I was on for two months um, out of the total of the six months over everything. And so my doctor tells me I can come off 25%. Um, and I jumped per day at this point. And I jumped over two days, 50% of the benzo. I'm down to close to 0.4 milligrams. Um, and that was a whole different journey for me. Um, I started convulsing. I had psychosis. I was vomiting, extreme vertigo. My nervous system was contracting. I mean, it still contracts. I'm still not healed, but you can see that this is natural. Like if I just let it happen, this is what naturally happens. Um, but I try not to let that, I have to hold back because it makes me nauseous. So um, that, what you just saw, Imagine like it was significantly, fat. I was like flying back and forth at this point. Like there was no controlling it. Um, I had, I mean, at that point, once I started to come off the benzo, my whole mind was altered. So like everything was from the perception of death. All I could see was death. We call it death goggles in, in the benzo community is a term coined. Um, all I could see was death. Um, I was... Uh, hallucinating, I started to see glass vases, black glass vases. When I would close my eyes, I would like, it was almost like I would just blink and it would just pop up this black vase that was crashing to the ground. I even bought a black vase after that looked like it just for, just so I would feel better that that's not in my head. But, um, that's, you know, that was definitely a symptom. I had really severe akathisia. I mean, like I, and I, and I couldn't walk like for those first couple weeks at that point during tapering. Cause then I started tapering after that. Um, I could not walk. Like I had severe jelly legs. Like my husband had to like help me. Um, we went and did MRI. <laughs> my doctor didn't, he's like, Oh my God, I think you had a brain aneurysm, a stroke. He's like, you need to go do an MRI, CAT scans, x-ray. And I did all of it. Everything came back clean. Nothing was on my brain. 
And uh, he still like, he had never once in the entire journey ever said benzo withdrawal. He never once told me what you're experiencing are due to it, the effects of benzos. Never once. I never once did any of these, neither of these two doctors told me that. Um, and so I, I couldn't endure this. Like the akathisia was so unbearable. Like my feet were bleeding from the amount of walking though I could not walk. So I'm like holding my husband for dear life, just trying to walk. And I had no idea what akathisia was. Like, I didn't know this was something with benzos. I didn't know that was a symptom. And when I look back to the SSRIs and SNRI, I also experienced a form of akathisia, which was lower on the spectrum. I would like pace back and forth in my complex building and listening to music while Eminem was like rapping in my head 120 miles an hour. And, um, and so I realized, oh my God, I experienced that symptom then too, after I learned about agathesia. Um, I dealt with DPDR, um, which much later, like when I actually jumped and went into benzo injury, these symptoms were a whole different animal, unfortunately. But um, psychosis, panic attacks, mania, everything just amplified on a whole different spectrum. And again, like, I mean, when I was convulsing, I mean, at that time, I just thought I was going to die, but, um, I didn't die. I was still here. And, um, that was when my husband found benzo buddies at this point, we had no idea what was happening. And then my husband found benzo buddies. And that was the beginning. I would say that was really the true beginning of healing for me. Um, even though it didn't feel like that for a really long time. Um, we found the Ashton manual, um, I chose not to migrate over to Valium. One, I didn't want to fucking support another benzo company. I didn't want to support Big Pharma. I didn't want to support the doctors. Um, so I decided to stay on my Xanax, um, which again, is short half-life. Like I'm a couple hours in this drug, you're, you're having no effects, but regardless, I'm having a paradoxical reaction. So it didn't even matter at that point. But um I was happy that I did choose to stay on Xanax at that point and didn't choose to migrate. I see leading experts today not always advising that anymore unless you're on a Xanax only. And even then, um, they would rather break out the dose um, three to four times a day, which is what I did. Um, I had broke up my pill um, into four pieces and took it throughout the day. So um, I did a rapid taper in my case, because it just, I never went back to some level of a base. Like it, these symptoms persisted throughout the whole taper. I only had the convulsions for those like first few days after that, I no longer had them. Um, but that was pretty much it. Everything else, the vertigo had lowered. I was dizzy. Apparently I'm still dizzy. Like this room is still spinning to me, but um, I was like permanently dizzy at that point. And so that was, that was, I, I just could never imagined that a human could ever experience this. And we, we really can't without the synthetic damage, like without chemicals, we cannot experience akathisia. We cannot experience this level of symptoms. Like someone with or natural anxiety does not experience M&Ms like spitting 120 miles an hour in their head, right? Like this is chemically induced symptoms so far on the spectrum we could never imagine. And so when I think about how many people had anxiety and depression and panic attacks before this drug, they would never believe it's this drug. They just think they're getting worse. I mean, I was convinced and I had zero of these symptoms before, zero. And I was convinced the drugs do such a great job at convincing you it is you. It's, it's just unimaginable. And so you have the drugs convincing you it's you, and then you have the doctors convincing you it's you. It's like, we have no chance unless you find Benzo Buddies, Benzo Warriors, the Ashton Manual, or know someone else that's going through it. There's no way we would end up believing ourselves. You're going to believe the doctors. This is what's so beyond devastating. Um, so I did a quick taper, seven months, which was hell. At that point, I stopped working. I went on leave. Um, I first asked for leave for three months. Um, <laughs> and then I had to ask for another four months. 
And I'm thinking, okay, after I get off the drug, I'm going to be better. That's what I thought. You would think I would have learned something by now, but nope, had no idea about benzo injury and bind. So, excuse me, I need some water. So I was, I took off seven months from my work. Thankfully they approved it both times. I mean, the first time they were legally bound to have to prove it. The second time I know that they considered it not, but fortunate for me, I had a history of outperforming since I've been with this company for years. I've hit every year I've hit my quota and outperform. So I use that. I'm like, Hey, I've outperformed every year. I'm going through something right now and I will be back. Like that was my stance. And fortunately they, um, they did accept, thank God. Um, so during that tapering, I actually, when I when I figured out through my husband that benzo buddies and what was happening, I could not believe that this was the drug. Even during the entire taper, I mean, the reassurance that I needed, oh, every 30 seconds, I needed my husband to tell me, this is not you, it's the drug. Because there was no way you would believe it. Like, I could not believe that this little pill has done this to me. There was, and so I really, even though my husband's literally reading literature to me, reading the Astrid manual, reading all this information, I could not believe it. He's reading stories. He's reading success stories. He's reading this to me. Could not believe it that this was the drug. So that kind of went throughout the whole seven months. But through those seven months, there was, right, there was this hope when we found out it was the benzo. Is that actually like, wait a minute, maybe it's been these psych drugs the entire time. And there was this little piece of hope that I held on because that was the only thing I had to hold on to was this little string. And um, to full transparency, uh, during that time, during the, um, the ketamine and the over sedation with the benzo and all of that, after that all happened, I mean, I had already decided I was going to leave this world. And I can't even imagine, like to think of who I was before all of these drugs, Suicide was the, I could not even fathom how someone could come to the conclusion to do that. And here I am, and I had decided, I'm like, there's no way I can live like this. Like, and that was so devastating for so many reasons. And so the suicidal ideation had only continued throughout this journey, to say the least. Um, but at that point, when I found out it was the benzo, I had decided, okay, well, well, I had somewhat believed it was the benzo. A, a string of me believed it was the benzo. I was like, okay, well, if it's the benzo, that means all of this is psych drug induced. And, but I'm still left with the PTSD. Again, I didn't know what protraction injury was from the SSRI and the SNRI. So I had thought I really developed PTSD. And to be honest, I probably did on some level. How could you fight for your life through these psych drugs and not develop PTSD, not knowing what you've developed, like not knowing what you happened? I think what makes it very obviously that it's induced by chemicals was that it happened right after I jumped off, which was an obvious sign of uh, chemical induced PTSD. So, um, so at that point I was like, well, if I get off these drugs, I still need to resolve this PTSD. So I decided to do cognitive processing therapy, which falls under the CBT umbrella. Cognitive processing therapy is a protocol um, to help rewire the brain. It literally helps rewire the neural pathways in your brain that have been redeveloped because of a traumatic event. Um, hands down, the best money I've ever spent. Going through beds of withdrawal, tapering, and doing CBT the most difficult thing I could ever imagined. Like I needed my husband to literally hold my hand as I'm shaking, doing this protocol. And thank God I did have him to help me. I don't think I could have done it without him. To be honest, at that point, I just had everything against me. I mean, this is not someone that developed PTSD and went to the, you know, do the protocol. This is someone that's now damaged, has neurotoxicity, is uh, brain damaged, fighting for her life, through benzo withdrawal to get off of the remaining and then having to do trauma protocol. But, but I have to say, it helped me so much through this journey. Once I was able to get it down with all my help, my husband's help, I remember doing this worksheet. I would fill in half of it. And this, my, from an, a PTSD episode, like your cortisol is spiking so high. Again, the benzos damage our car, cortisol, which is really also highlighted in the Ashton manual. Um, the effects, but 
um, my cortisol would go so high in the PTS, the PTSD protocol, the worksheet, all of it, after I would do half of it, boom, it would plummet. My cortisol would plummet. I would actually just lose consciousness. So I would hold my pen halfway through and just knock out for a few seconds. And then either I would come back to consciousness and then take a nap, or I would just go straight into a nap after like through that. Um, my husband would just like find me like sleeping on the couch or just knocked out with the papers all over the floor. It kind of looked like the stock market with all those white papers back in the day. That's what my house looked like. It was covered in these white papers. That's how many I had to do because I was having so many episodes, especially, especially near the end. Those final weeks of those final doses, it was nonstop episode, episode, episode. And thank God I had the CPT protocol tool because I don't know. I don't know if I could have survived it. I, I don't know, to be honest. So Anyway, I just wanted to mention that because that could be really helpful. Uh, the Dr. Ashton manual, she also highlights how effective CBT can be. I know a lot of people um, find it hard and it is hard. I'm not going to lie to you. Like going through benzo withdrawal and having to do a trauma protocol sounds crazy. Um, but it's true that they have veteran. The VA does this for veterans when they come back from the war. They do this while they're withdrawing from alcohol. Um, so it definitely can be done. Um, most doctors I've seen have also suggested the exact same. Is it easy? No, I'm not going to lie. I needed help. Some people, if you have less symptoms than me, maybe that's something you could do on your own. Um, I would definitely try, just try and see if you could have someone help you. Um, so now I'm coming up to the final dose. I take, uh, I get off. And so crazy, like literally the next day, like while I'm still experiencing all of these symptoms, I had like one, like a like 30 second window of things just looking normal. I'm like, oh my God, this is the beginning. I'm gonna have my life back. I'm gonna heal. I have the PTSD protocol, C which is the C CBT protocol. I'm going to like, I'm going to get off these drugs. I, I'm going to be healed. Like this is the beginning. I had that small window. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that didn't, that's not exactly how things went. And um, after like maybe a week or a half after being off the drug, which is how long, right? The It takes Xanax about two weeks to fully leave your body, right? Most benzos, some take longer, like clonopin and Valium, but um. I was getting close to that two week mark. And all of a sudden I started experiencing like really bad symptoms. Like I, the back of my head was just so much pain. It's just jam packed with GABA receptors back there, especially the cerebellum. And it was burning. Like I was like having third, it felt like first degree burns in the back of my head. And I was telling my husband, it hurts, it hurts. Can you just look? And instead of just looking, he just shoved his thumb into the back of my head. And it was like a full-blown electrocution, but it was like I went into a dark black hole orbit while I'm being electrocuted to death. It was, I can't, I, I can't even explain it. Um, that would go on to be the beginnings of my electrocutions. Um, and so I didn't know what was happening. I also felt my organs all started contracting. And I'm like, oh my God, maybe this is a UTI. I knew that like um, infections and viruses run through the central nervous system. So I was like, oh my God, I must have a UTI. And that's why these in symptoms are increasing. I had no idea about bind, benzo injury. I've heard of pause, but there was like no reason in my mind that I was going to have this something, whatever is called pause. I thought pause was like prolonged anxiety, but like, I, I was like, I was on this drug for six months. There's no reason for me to get whatever this thing that my husband's talking about pause. Um, so I definitely did not associate all of this together. And so, um, I thought it was an infection. I spoke to my doctor, my New York doctor, and I'm like, oh my God, I don't know what's happening. I'm getting off these drugs and this is happening. I'm like, maybe it's a UTI, maybe it's an infection. I know infections run through the central nervous system. What do you think? Okay, well, let's just prescribe you uh, antibiotic. And um, 
not only did he prescribe me an antibiotic, he also prescribed me an antifungal for yeast infection, just in case that was happening. Diflucan. So I took, I took the antibiotics. Um, and um, if you all probably know that's listening to my story, how we should not be taking antibiotics unless life or death, or at least proven black and white evidence. Even now, I would, even if I had a positive test for a UTI, I would do natural remedies like piece of garlic down there between the lady lips, or I would take apple cider vinegar, a teaspoon in water. I would use coconut oil down there to lower the pH um, and see if those things help me. But obviously I had no test that showed a positive result for a UTI. I just thought that may be happening. The doctor agreed and he prescribed me those antibiotics. So it, imagine if this one doctor was actually educated in the effects of all these drugs. I would have never ended up here. I would have after what happened with the SSRI, SNRI, I would have got off those drugs, experienced symptoms, known that was protracted, would have never went down this road. I would have never ended up in so much stress that I would give a steroid I would have never went on the bends. Like th that would have been my destiny. That's not exactly what happened. So uh, <laughs> I took the antibiotics and uh, it only just pushed me along further into the bind spectrum. At this point, because it's quite a lot, um, I cannot move my body. I lost 98% mobility of my body. I actually only had access to my hands and my forearms. I couldn't do this. I could just like move my hands and my forearms. Um, the rest of my body was burnt. It felt like first degree burns through my entire body. It felt like someone took my nervous system out, put it into an air fryer, fried it at 400 for like 30 minutes and put it back into my body. Um, I could no longer turn my head, which I really can't now because I'm super dizzy, <laughs> but I couldn't actually like move, turn my head an inch up or down or open my mouth more than an inch without being electrocuted. So I also could no longer lay on my back. I can no longer turn to my left. I had to face the right side. So laying on my left shoulder, facing the right in bed, which I could no longer get out of. Um, I had very severe DPDR. I had um, severe tardive akathisia. When you get off of the benzo tapering, it's then considered tardive akathisia. Um, I could no longer eat basically any food. I mean, I was limited to less than five types of foods at this point, with bone broth, some vegetables and chicken and beef. I mean, that was pretty much whatever my mom, my mom had moved in at this point, whatever my mom could make out of those five things I would have to eat. Um, I had a lots of hormone damage. So my, um, uh, insulin receptors were so damaged that I would have to eat every 30 minutes. So I know there's two different types of people that experience benzo withdrawal and injury, people that could not eat and they lose so much weight. And then there's the people that constantly have to eat and gain rapid weight. Well, that was me. I mean, through this journey, I mean, I was a hundred pounds. I was like 110 pounds wet with muscle five foot two before all of this. And I'm now pushing near 200 pounds, maybe 190 something. Um, so I gained, I mean, I was just gaining rapid weight and I could, I had to eat every 30 minutes. Cause if I didn't eat, I was, my nerves would hurt even more, which was hard to even believe. Um, the room was spinning. I would be on that Bodhi feeling, which is still common and I still have it. Um, and, um, <laughs> I just had to eat every 30 minutes, which was horrific. Um, um, I had, there was, I experienced unfortunately like over 200 symptoms simultaneously for years because of it. Um, and so I'm just trying to mention the worst symptoms. So again, DPDR, akathisia, I was fully disabled. I could not feed myself. So my husband actually had to feed me for the first six months. Um, that was like that, those were the kind of changes that kind of happened over time. It was like, okay, now you can feed yourself or after the two year mark or around the like 20 month mark, because I went, um, carnivore, I was able to eat every two hours <laughs> versus every hour or 30 minutes. So like, that's the type of progress I had. Um, 
let's see. I had severe panic attacks, mania, everything, everything that you search, like sensitivity to touch such neuropathy. So I had nerve damage throughout my entire head. I had severe sinus. Oh my God. I couldn't leave the bedroom for six months. I mean, I started to leave the bedroom. It did not make me feel good after six months, but I couldn't even leave the bedroom if I wanted to, because the temperature changed from the bedroom to the hallway even if it was like one degree or less than one degree, it felt like a grenade went off in my sinuses. It was, oh my God, I can't, I can't. Um, it was unbearable. And I, I couldn't even get out of bed. Like, so we had to put a little toilet in, a little portable toilet in the room because that would be, I could only stand up with my husband's help to get to this little toilet. It was, it was a disaster. It was a disaster, to be honest. Um, I had a lot of symptoms. I had a lot of symptoms. So yeah, I fell under that 200 symptom bucket simultaneously. These symptoms were all happening at the same time. Um, and unfortunately, I was one of those people that had to work through this. Um, I would work from bed. Um, I would keep the camera off. I would take one meeting a day. I would We would put a fan in the corner and put it with... Um, pens to move the mouse. So I looked active because uh, I could not look at the computer for longer than 30 minutes. Um, and so talk about um, time management. Ooh, I became so good at that because it was like, do I need to do this today? Yes or no. And it's like, can I push it to tomorrow? Yes. And so I took one meeting a day. I did this for like a long time, definitely for the first year one meeting, no more than one meeting a day. And um, and I somehow did it from bed. Again, I could use my fingers to type. Thank God that was something that I could. Um, I had to work, we had two mortgages um, and my husband had to quit his job to become my caretaker. We had decided that I was at greater risk of, uh, of suicide without him here. And so it was better that I physically suffered more by working at the cost of having my husband here, making sure I didn't kill myself. Um, so that was really hard. Um, I got occipital neuralgia, which is a compression of the occipital nerve that shoots through the neck into the back of the head where the occipital part of the brain is and then shoots through the eyes. So I would wear red glasses, these like brain injury glasses I have, they're called Theraspecs, super helpful. They were super helpful much later on in the journey. <laughs> At first, I don't think nothing helped me. And uh, to be honest, I progressively got worse for the first three months. Um, it was just, it continued to get worse and worse. So I just kept going further and further on the spectrum. And um, yeah, and uh, I have basically lived that way um, for quite a while. I am now 30 months off benzos and I mean, I'm sitting here in front of you. Sitting is very painful, has always been painful. Um, is this painful still for me? Yes. Um, am I able to do it? Yes. So I now I'm able to take maybe like two and a half to three hours max of meetings, but not every day. So like if it's one day of three hour meetings, okay, but the next day, an hour or two. Um, so it kind of, it needs to, I can't do three hours every day of meetings, but I am still working and I've managed to, to make it this far. I don't know how, and um, I've somehow hit my numbers. Um, it's quite magical um, what we have the capability to do while we're fighting for our lives. It's almost like because I lacked so much, I compensated through work even if it was through that one meeting a day, 30 minutes. Um, I'm in sales, by the way, I'm in technical sales. So I work in cloud computing and cybersecurity. So that was, it's hard to believe sometimes. Um, I had lung suppression, so it was really hard for me to talk. So every day I would just tr not talk to my husband. I would cry, but I would try not to say anything because my lungs were so suppressed that I needed to save my breath for that one meeting a day. Um, but I did it.
I did do it. So I am, so let's talk about where I am. I think we, a lot of us know what a lot of these symptoms look like. So I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, within those 30 months, I did catch two separate viruses, which does push you kind of further into benzo injury. It's really, that was really, really difficult. And I actually got the first one immediately after I jumped off and after the antibiotics. So I had an, some virus, wasn't COVID, shit, it felt worse. Like it took me months to recuperate and it, my husband got sick as well. Um, so yeah, that was, that's worth mentioning is to be aware, wear masks. If you go to a doctor's office, sanitize your hands, have your caretaker help you with that. My husband had to take care of me on that. Um, LA Yapi. And so, um, yeah, so now I'm 30 months. Thank you. I'm 30 months off. I do work still um, and not fully healed, but I know I will be healed. I have no doubt that I will heal. Are there days that I doubt it? Yes. Um, but I do know we all heal in time. I don't know what my timeline looks like. Um, I am able to, you know, okay, I do two, three meetings a day. I walk now on my own for 15, 20 minutes in the morning. Um, and I'm able to walk to like the bathroom or, you know, to the kitchen on my own now, I do have to lay down. So like after this recording, I will be laying down and not moving at all. Um, and I started also last month, I started to be able to shower on my own. I do need to sit in a handicap chair and have a cane, um, but I can do that now. Showers are like, oh, we know how difficult showers can be for many of us. Um, it helps with the migraines and the muscle nerve pain while I'm in it now. Um, but I suffer a lot after the shower. Uh, and so, um, yeah, I didn't, I mean, do I still see perception of death? Yes. I don't feel emotions yet. I'm able to smile and I'm able to put this smile and, and look happy. Um, I'm able to now recognize that's what I should do where for the first two years until I went carnivore, I had to put stickers on my screen that says smile and laugh when others laugh. Like I had no ability to, to do that, like just dead inside. And so now I have the ability to smile. Um, do I feel that inside? No, but I'm able to tell when to do it. I'm able to do it to look a certain way, especially for work. People don't seem to care about your life and you kind of have to do what you have to do to get through. You also don't want these people to know what you're going through, to be honest. Like if they knew what I was going through, they probably would have stopped me working years ago from it. So, um, but now I am able to, to do the work um, and I'm able to at least put a smile on my face as you can see through this recording. Um, and after I went carnivore, I would say I felt that was probably the first time I could feel there was some type of soul in me. So I could feel like that. I tell my husband, I could feel 5% of my soul after going carnivore in my case, uh, which felt like a lot more than a negative a thousand. Um, and yeah, so what else do I do now? I, I, I do the lettuce grow. So I garden a little bit. Lettuce grow is helpful because I don't have to bend. I still have a lot of pain through my nervous system sitting up or sitting on the ground is just really hard. So lettuce grow was really helpful. Um, I don't watch TV. I started recently just some shows, like one movie once in a while. I mean, that's better than not. I couldn't watch TV for the, over the first two years going through a benzo injury and bind. So that's improvement. I can watch a show now. Um, I could sit in the car, not that it feels good, but it's durable and it's a distraction to just drive around my community with some music on my husband would drive. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, when I look back, yeah, there's a lot of improvement when I look back to the first two years. And again, I'm 30 months now. Um, so yes, so that is my story. I will probably do a few versions of these to speak about specific topics or, or times in the timeline, but I think for now, that's a really good overall of the story. My doctor had never, um, ever acknowledged benzo withdrawal or benzo injury, has never said those words out of his mouth, the New York, the other doctor. The New York doctor I have cut out completely. I had a solid conversation with him 
And while he didn't admit to anything, um, it was very emotional for him. And um, I told him, I walked into your office with a, 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 what's it called? A structural brain injury. And I left your office with a chemical brain injury a billion times worse. And so um, I think he probably will forever remember me based off those words that I shared with him that day. And I do keep the Florida doctor in my life because she's a mobile, a mobile doctor. So I'm able to do like, get the nurse to come here and test my blood whenever I have like, or tests for infections. So it's helpful. Um, and when I can, I will cut her out as well. Um, but not before I get to share my words with her and let her know um, what suffering she has caused me. Um, I'm actually publishing a book next next year on my journey and how through that journey, I learned to heal my heart. So I have healed my heart. I've not physically healed in my brain, but I know that will come. Um, I have done a lot of work on myself and I can do, I could talk about that in another video if anyone's interested, but um, I do think it's an opportunity for us to look at ourselves and how we ended up here. How, what, what led us to that moment in time? In my case, it was what led me to that moment for the TBI. Yes, was I a victim of my trainer that knocked me out showing a demonstration? Absolutely, on every human level, we are victims of all of this, right? Of what the doctors have done and how what led us there, um, in my case at least, the, the brain injury. But um, spiritually, on a higher perspective, higher level, what led us to that moment in time? And I had to look at that um, and I learned. <laughs> And I had to go through, I did a lot of somatic healing, which is healing through the body. Um, if you look at wild animals, they do not have PTSD. Um, domestic animals do, zoo animals do, and that's because it's induced by humans, but wild animals do not. And that's because um, wild animals know how to eject their trauma from their body. Um, how to process that. They don't have as powerful brains as we do. They don't suppress this after a traumatic event, which happens very often for them. <laughs> they go hide into a little quiet area and they allow their body, they start vibrating, shaking all of this stuff their body goes through. And that's how they release the trauma. And we have that ability too, as humans. Unfortunately, we have not learned that. And our powerful brains prevent that from happening. So we just have to allow our bodies to communicate, but that was super helpful for me. Uh, and again, I'm, I mean, I'm writing a book about it, so I hope it's helpful for others at some point in time. But um, anyway, that is my story. I hope that was at all helpful to even be able to relate to me if any of this happened. Um, and I am so sorry that your doctors have done this to you as well. My heart goes out to any benzo warrior, any psych drug warrior, to be honest. I know benzos are quite specific. They are definitely considered the mother load. And then you have antipsychotics that cause dystonia and tardive dyskinesia, which is a whole nother animal, which I know could technically happen with benzos as well, but we don't typically see that. Um, but I have to tell you, <laughs> if you're going through benzo withdrawal, your soul our souls are like the militia of military that have come here to endure this journey. People that have the most suffering have the greatest purpose. And that doesn't mean you have to go out and help and serve and help people, um, but you will make some impact in some way, even if you don't know it. So I'm just sharing that with you because these, you are some brave souls to come here and endure this. Um, but anyway, that is enough for me for today. And I hope that was helpful just to share my story. And I look forward to other people sharing their story. We need to get the word out. All right. Take care, guys.